Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Plans for a history-making virtual civil court trial in Bear County have hit a temporary snag. Jury summons were sent out last month. Today was the deadline for prospective jurors to respond. So what's that snag? Here's our Paul Venema. The trial in 57th District Court is part of a pilot project to explore whether jury trials can effectively be conducted virtually. We're all dressed up and nowhere to go. <laughs> Our jurors are ready. Judge Antonia Artiega said they're still waiting for consent from attorneys on both sides. Things are always unpredictable. Uh, we had had um, our number one case uh, is no longer available, so we'll go to uh, whatever case we may or may not have a bill thereafter. A six-judge committee will now evaluate other possible cases. Our trial date is scheduled for the 19th, and uh, we're still looking uh, to see if there are any others uh, because currently we need to have both sides consent. Despite the change of plans, Artiega is optimistic about the future of virtual trials. She said they've worked well in at least two other Texas counties. I think change is really difficult for a lot of people, and I think once we get the first one out, I think it'll be out so much better. Paul Venom on KSAT 12 News. While activists may be calling to defund the police, that does not appear to be where San Antonio officials are headed right now. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us city staff and council members are eyeing how the department could change. He joins us now live to explain this evening. So Garrett, council members and city staff were discussing the department, the police department this afternoon as part of a budget session. What all did they have to say? While there were questions about why the SAPD budget was bumped up about $8 million over last year, it's largely because of scheduled pay increases for officers, there weren't any calls to drastically cut the budget. However, the city manager has been pushing for a path that could make major changes to the department just down the road. City manager Eric Walsh has proposed a review process of the SAPD, including public input that could reshape what the city expects from SAPD officers, what role they play, and what kind of calls they respond to. But if they change all that up, it would also mean finding some way to foot the bill for whoever would respond instead. So we're going to have to, if we shift responsibilities like that, then we're going to have to identify funding or, or find new funding or cut back on police spending and maybe not hire positions in the future or not add positions in the future, but that's how you sort of rebalance that. City staff also went over a resolution of priorities for renegotiating the current police union contract. That resolution, which was put forward by the mayor, focuses on the discipline process. The police chief and other city officials have spoken before about what they feel is the chief's inability to punish misconduct because of protections officers have from the contract and state law. So if they go this route, what's the timeline? Well, for the union contract, that doesn't expire until next September. And as far as reviewing the, reviewing the department and possibly proposing changes, Eric Walsh is expecting that could take until next spring. Live downtown, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. He led Bear County deputies and state troopers on an hour long chase, but his nephew says he was supposed to be out buying food for the family. 27 year old Anthony Quiroga is accused of leading law enforcement on that chase at 2:30 yesterday afternoon near Highway 16 and Twin Valley. In that hour, officials say he rear ended an 18 wheeler, rammed a construction company's gate that you see right there before bailing and running from the car in the 1300 block of West Hutchins Place. His nephew said that's the neighborhood where his family was waiting for him. They'd asked him to pick up food at a nearby store for a plate sale honoring his late nephew. The chase ended right here. He ran, he ran, and I was on the phone with him. And I heard him, so I started running the other way too. And I saw him get tackled, and that's when I started crying. During the chase, Kuroga briefly stopped to let a passenger out, then took off again. That passenger, Sarah Jane Fowler, was arrested for evading arrest and unauthorized use of a vehicle. Kuroga is charged with several things, including evading arrest and aggravated assault against a public servant.
New at six, New Braunfels police turning to their followers on social media for some help catching two men caught on camera ripping off a convenience store. It happened a few weeks ago. Surveillance cameras getting a good look at the suspects on July 28th, entering the Circle K in the 500 block of State Highway 46. The two men wearing hoodies and face coverings can be seen walking around the counter. As the clerk then opens the cash drawer, one grabs the money, the other goes for cigarettes. You can see the clerk got out of the way there. Then the pair ran outside to a car, which investigators say may have had a third suspect behind the wheel. They were last seen turning onto FM 1101. Anyone with any information on who these guys are asked to call Comal County Crime Stoppers. That number is 830-620-TIPS. Reaction tonight now that Joe Biden has added yet another first to the long list that Kamala Harris already has achieved. The presumptive Democratic presidential nominee chose a woman of color as his running mate. The newly minted Biden-Harris team making their first appearance together just a few hours ago. Jesse Degriado talks to a seasoned political observer about what Kamala Harris will bring to the Democratic ticket come November. A debate stage was the setting for a pivotal moment between friends turned political rivals. There was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools, and she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. You don't want somebody who's going to be mealy mouthed, who's not going to, to, to say their, what they believe. Um, she'd definitely be doing that. Also known for grilling witnesses, even the Attorney General of the United States. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh... Yes or no? Could you, could you repeat that question? As a former prosecutor, it said Kamala Harris will revel in confronting blistering attacks by President Trump. This is a woman who is not going to shy away from, from a good fight. As for Republican voters, Taylor says Kamala Harris is not the far left-wing candidate many think she is. I would say middle-of-the-road liberal in the in the same mold as, as Joe Biden or, or Barack Obama. Picking Harris, he says, is a reward in a sense. It definitely demonstrates the power of African-American women and the fact that they are the strongest and most loyal block of voters in the Democratic Party. And being that Harris will be a heartbeat away from the presidency if Biden is elected, Taylor says she's up to the job. She seems to have demonstrated that already, and I don't see why she wouldn't in the future. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Take a look at Time Saver traffic. Here is the camera here at 410 in San Pedro. You can see what appears to be a stalled vehicle right there on the shoulder. You're looking at the on ramp to 410, the eastbound lanes right at San Pedro. It's certainly backing up traffic right before drivers get to that uh, police car and that vehicle there, uh, but traffic freeing up shortly thereafter. So something to keep in mind if you're headed that way. A recent warning from more than 200 scientists say that COVID-19 may be more infectious than even previously thought. They state that COVID-19 can be transmitted through the air by particles that can linger for hours. Well, now a team of researchers has found a solution to those aerosols, and it all starts with the way people spit. Ursula Perry has details. A single cough? or sneeze can send hundreds of virus particles that may carry the coronavirus right into the air. If we could reduce the amount of droplets that are sustained in the air, I think it'd be an effective measure. Is a cough drop the answer? This team is developing a product similar to a cough drop that can thicken your saliva particles and make them heavier when released during a cough or sneeze. Then they will tend to fall down rather than transmit to the next person. Using high-speed cameras, they use over-the-counter ingredients to test which will work best for their cough drop. Cornstarch or, or peanut flour or uh, uh, a jar, a jar, for example, these are uh, good thickeners. The team expects our cough drop to last about 20 to 40 minutes for a trip to a grocery store or a short flight. They also say the combination of their cough drop and a mask could decrease the space needed between people. It could bring the distance down to two feet. Uh, about a third uh, third of the uh, CDC guideline distance. Have people interact with each other more. This team is hoping to make the product available by the end of this year. How you ask? Well, they received a $200,000 award from the National Science Foundation for rapid response research. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News.
Look outside with live cam this evening. Another day in August, another 100 <laughs> degree reading, Adam. Yeah, our 21st so far this year, and I believe our sixth consecutive. But today we made it up to 101 for the high temperature and the aquifer also took a hit today down half a foot on this Wednesday. 10 day average at 657.6. So we're still in stage one restrictions. As for your pollen count, three allergens today, mold low along with pigweed and even fall elm. All right, the entire state feeling the heat. 104 Lubbock today, El Paso topped out at 106. Here in San Antonio, 101 and Del Rio had a high of 105 with a high temperature and it feels a few degrees warmer when you factor in the humidity. Air temperatures right now for the most part right around 100 and even slightly above. I mean, you get up to 104 Carrizo Springs, but Gonzales right now at 101. This evening, I think it's going to take until about 10 o'clock till we can get down to the upper 80s. You'll notice the heat and of course the humidity out there. A bit of a breeze out of the southeast though. And then tomorrow we do this all over again. 78 in the morning, a lot of sunshine in the afternoon and making it up to I think to about 102 for the afternoon high temperature. So it's another day where we're going to put a big strain on the power grid. CPS Energy calls it a energy, a peak energy demand day. So we suggest lowering your usage between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Best way, just turn up the thermostat by two degrees. All right, we'll have your full forecast coming up. All right, it is that time of the show. We're just a few seconds away from today's daily briefing on the latest status of COVID-19 cases in Bear County. We're going to hear from the mayor and the county judge as we do every day about how the numbers are looking. Let's listen in. Tonight we're reporting 291 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 43,455. Uh, that pushes our seven-day average down slightly to 259 cases per day. Uh, unfortunately, we do have a number of deaths to report tonight, and these are deaths that uh, were investigated between June 12th and August 11th. So we're reporting 26 new deaths tonight, um, and again, these, these are uh, those that have been verified and fully investigated. That brings our total to 545 friends, neighbors, loved ones uh, who have been lost to COVID-19 in our community. Uh, so let's please keep them and their families in our prayers. Uh, on the website, you'll also t see 261 cases that are pending investigation, and those are, again, reported by the state, uh, have not been fully verified by Metro Health. Over in our hospitals, we, tonight we're reporting 710 people in the hospital. That's down 10 from yesterday. We've had 53 new admissions to the hospital, so we're starting to see our admissions levels daily uh, remain stable. 309 are in the ICU and 213 folks on ventilators this evening. 52% of ventilators are available and 15% of our staffed hospital beds are available. Again, the stress level uh, in our hospital system has eased slightly, but it still remains very high. Therefore, Metro Health recommends remote learning at this time. And if you are able to continue to stay home, and if you're not at home, please wear a mask and maintain physical distancing. Let me move it over to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, you know, all the indications are moving in the right directions, but they're moving fairly slowly. Uh, and so, um, if you look at the fact we're looking at schools starting on September the 8th, uh, we've got roughly about 24 days to uh, get down where we need to be so that we can safely open the schools. So you'll have to work with us and everybody has to be careful in making we sure we do this the right way. And then as we open schools, uh, that we take all the precautions necessary to do that. Uh, I did issue another executive order today. Uh, because mine ran out, it's the only reason I did it today. Uh, but we are going to close county parks uh, over the uh, holiday. Uh, we'll close it on 11:59 uh, p.m. on Friday, September the 4th, and it'll be stay closed to 11:59 p.m. on Monday, September the 7th. Uh, we, <clears throat> the mayor and I, we we did that with our parks over July the 4th, and we saw a tremendous improvement over what happened. Uh, uh, the previous the previous holiday. So uh, leading up to school, uh, we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to make it as safe as we can here. And so that'll be a step forward. We will continue to uh, stop the foreclosure sales. Uh, there was one scheduled for September the 1st. We'll keep that policy in line. 
uh, not uh, not having the foreclosure sale on September the 5th. But so it's pretty much uh, what we've been doing, Mayor, except um, we wanted to get the parks in there. Well, thank you, Judge Wolf. Um, and I do want to mention, um, you know, as we've been seeing the pandemic unfold, not just here locally, but also across the state and across the country, we've now crossed 5 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the United States. A full 10 percent of those cases are here in Texas. So there are quite a bit uh, more cases and, and several outbreaks in other cities around Texas. And so keep in mind, if you are visiting folks, if you're leaving San Antonio, take extra care as you go to certain places uh, that may be experiencing a continued outbreak. We are certainly not out of the woods here in San Antonio either, but we want to take full precautions uh, as uh, our public health professionals have reminded us. Um, and also it is worth noting that San Antonio has been doing a good job. If you are uh, continuing to practice your physical distancing, wearing of masks, we thank you for that. The numbers are starting to move in the right direction, as we've said re repeatedly. If you have if you have suffered and have now uh, have healed from um, COVID-19, we do encourage you to consider a blood donation and also a test for antibodies. You can visit SouthTexasBlood.org to see if you are. So we are moving slow. We are moving in the right direction, but it is happening slowly. That's the words of County Judge Nelson Wolf tonight. Also, he issued a new executive order because his old one expired and included in that executive order the shutdown of county parks basically over the Labor Day holiday. They'll shut down on Friday night and not open until late on Monday night and also stopping foreclosure sales uh, that routinely take place on the uh, county courthouse steps. Those will not be happening and haven't happened for quite some time. The mayor and the judge saying that what we are doing is working because like you said, all indicators point in the right direction. Uh, hospitalizations are still trending downward. Our seven day average of new cases over a 24 hour period continues to head downward, but we do have a long way to go. The judge pointing out we've got about 24 days until uh, school is set to start after Labor Day in person. And so we, we've got a lot of work to do they're saying before schools can reopen safely uh, to in-person learning. So keep up all of those things that we're all continuing to talk about. The mask wearing, the social distancing, staying home when you can. Yeah, I do want to mention 26 new deaths were reported today, basically confirmed today by Metro Health might be a better way to put it. These are cases that are between June and August. Uh, we now stand at 545 confirmed deaths by Metro Health in Bear County. All right, let's turn to weather now. Adam, it has been another triple digit day out there. How many times do we get to say that? <laughs> well, in August, Probably quite a, a lot. few. <laughs> We're going to You're be able keeping to count, though. Yeah, we are. Today was our 21st day of the year, and we average about 12. So high temperatures today. We're up there, 101 here in San Antonio after morning low of 78 degrees. The average high, by the way, 97. And Del Rio got as hot as 105. So we've actually teamed up with our KSAC community partners to raise awareness to the the uh, dangers of hot vehicles out there. Look at that, 103 degrees in our parking lot, but look at the temperature inside the van, 142. Now, earlier today, Katie Blake and I looked at the temperature and it was up to 150 inside the vehicle. Now, Jennifer Northway was here throughout the day. If you watched any, any other newscast, you saw her get interviewed. And one thing that really stood out to me is that usually it's alternative caregivers who may accidentally leave a child or pet in a vehicle. So something to keep in mind there. All right, let's take a look at our temperatures outside. It is peak season for heat here in San Antonio. Divine's 105, Castroville 102, Canyon Lake right now at 93, 95 Bernie and Comfort at 97. These are August temperatures. <laughs> A perfect example of August temperatures right here. August at its best in San Antonio. Now tomorrow morning will be in the 70s, upper 70s for most of us by the afternoon. We do it all over again. Catula 102, Kerrville 98, and New Braunfels about 100 degrees. Timberwood Park 98, 101 Elmendorf and Lackland area, 101 along with Castroville. Quiet weather pattern right now. A few showers in the panhandle of Texas and far west Texas and especially desert southwest. It is, after all, the uh, monsoon season in the desert southwest. So a good amount of sunshine again tomorrow. 78 to start the day, 102 for the afternoon high temperature. And then you look ahead and we really don't see a change in our temperatures until next week. A shift in our weather pattern could trim off just a few degrees and it gives us a little bit of hope, a glimmer of hope. 
for a few isolated showers starting Monday. All right, thanks, Adam. We're just a few weeks. Think about it, like two weeks away from Thursday, high school football starting, Larry. Yes. And some roster changes potentially happening for one of the big players. Yes, Judson Rockets got some bad news today. Jordan Battles and LJ Butler transferred to play for the Rockets. Well, the district executive committee today voted no. We'll hear from both those young men coming up. Plus, the Big 12 football is moving full steam ahead. Coming up. Conference is moving ahead with plans to play college football and other fall sports. They all join the ACC and SEC in taking the field amid the coronavirus pandemic. The move comes one day after the Big Ten and Pac-12 announced they will not play this fall. The Big 12 Board of Directors has approved a plan to begin fall sports after September 1st. Football schedule allows each team to play one non-conference game before league play begins September 26th. The schools will all play each other to give them 10 total games with the Big 12 title game scheduled for December 12th. Commissioner Bob Bullsby is pleased with today's decision. I personally wanted to see us get to this point in August so that we could uh, have a look at what preseason camp looked like and uh, to to see uh, what we might have learned to do uh, as we went along. And, and, you know, frankly, we found that what we thought was golden uh, 60 days ago is, is garbage today. And uh, there's uh, it's a, an ever-evolving environment, and we will find ourselves uh, with uh, with uh, bumpy spots during the fall. There isn't any doubt about that. Uh, but uh, I think we're very well prepared to deal with those things. And uh, so I, I feel good about the decision going forward. I believe our, our board feels good about it. The conference schedule for Texas begins on the road for the first time since 2017 when UT visits Texas Tech September 26th. The Red River Showdown at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas remains on for October the 10th. Here's what Steel Grade and Horns DB Caden Stern said on the Big 12 continuing fall sports and involving student athletes in the discussion. Quote, I think it's great that the Big 12 is continuing with fall sports right now. Obviously, we as players want to play as long as it's safe for us. It's been good that the Big 12 has allowed us to be involved in the process because there's obviously a lot of uncertainty and for us to get some sort of an answer that helps ease our minds. We want to play. So to have that schedule and to see the structure of what it's going to be look like is relieving for us as players. And that allows Sam and I to have the opportunity to share all of that information with our entire team. End quote. Judson football suffered some tough news today. Dual threat quarterback Jordan Battles and running back LJ Butler will not be able to play for the Rockets this season, at least for the time being. We're told the district executive committee for 27-6A voted 6-0 against both guys playing for J-Rock. Battles transferred from Brandeis and Butler transferred from Wagner. Both are class of 2021 and two of the area's best football players. We spoke with both of them at BSA Sports Lab this afternoon to get their reaction. She was really disappointed and upset because I shouldn't be held accountable for a family decision because we moved into that area. So she feels like she shouldn't be have to fight for me to be able to play football. My dad is not pleased because my dad feels that he shouldn't have to go and explain himself on, on why he moved our family to random people that he doesn't know. He has to explain his our personal life to people that we don't know. LJ's mother and Jordan's father will both appeal the decision. In the meantime, LJ and JB will continue to work out and stay ready. That, that's a lot of uncertainty this close to the, the season. It is, and with coronavirus and everything going on as well, so we don't really know. Yeah, thank you, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. More students and teachers are speaking up about how they want schools to return to in-person learning this fall. Some saying it should be a choice to come back to the classroom. Others saying there's no way to do that safely. And as medical workers push forward with potential vaccines, Russia claims to have one approved already. But as ABC's Trevor Alt reports, experts are, are not convinced it works or that it is safe. 
As the clock winds down for American school districts to lay out plans for the fall semester, three New Jersey education associations want all schools moved online, saying safe in-person learning is not achievable. New Jersey's governors now signed an executive order clearing public and non-public schools and colleges to reopen, and those districts who cannot meet health guidelines will begin online. Not only will this not be a normal school year, furthermore, there is no one-size-fits-all plan to this very difficult situation. Thousands of students across America are already in quarantine because of confirmed COVID-19 cases in schools that return for in-person learning, though some students are still fighting to stay in the classroom. Everyone has the right to make their own decisions and have opinions, but we shouldn't be forced to go online because others are fearful. In the race for a medical solution to the pandemic, Russia is now claiming to have the first COVID-19 vaccine, though health officials around the world say it hasn't yet been properly tested. I hope that the Russians have actually definitively proven that the vaccine is safe and effective. I seriously doubt that they've done that. Right now, the United States has several potential vaccines in late-stage human trials being tested on tens of thousands of volunteers, including one from drug company Moderna. The Trump administration aims to have hundreds of millions of doses available in the beginning of 2021. Never before has a vaccine in the developed world gone from phase one to phase three as quickly uh, as the Moderna vaccine. And today's scientists with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, whose projections are often used by the White House Coronavirus Task Force, say based on current trends, the cities that would likely be the next hotspots for the virus are Baltimore, Chicago, and Boston. Trevor Alt, ABC News, New York. Well, you just heard about it, and it appears there is a growing list of countries interested in the COVID-19 vaccine that Russia claims to have created. Guatemala. The latest to say it wants on the list. The foreign ministry says Guatemala taking diplomatic steps with Russia to be included in the priority list. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced yesterday that his country registered the first coronavirus vaccine and that his daughter received it. But there are a lot of medical experts, as you just heard, questioning the safety and effectiveness of that vaccine since the crucial phase three of the trial only began today. A family kicked off a Southwest Airlines flight because their three-year-old son wouldn't put on a mask. The family was traveling back to Midland from Houston. The mother said her son has sensory processing disorder and doesn't like his face touched. She even had a note about his condition from their doctor. Southwest Airlines says all customers over the age of two have to cover their faces while traveling, something that's pointed out during the booking and online check-in process. I think there needs to be something in place for, you know, children or even adults with disabilities um, who can't wear a mask. They should have some kind of exemptions. She said her son didn't wear a mask while boarding or even on the flight to Midland. They ended up driving from Houston to Midland instead. All right, turning to our weather situation. Hot. It's it's hot. This is where you got to get creative this time of year, right, Adam? Well, I just make thermometers. You guys don't can't see it on this camera shot, but I make thermometers in the background too. Creative, just multitasking too. Well, when do you start making the Christmas ones? Have you already made already, them? Already calibrated my That's first batch of them. Okay. Yeah, so I've got about six or seven of them, of them already calibrated, ready to go. I just have to make the scales. And I'm working with Santa Jim on our new design this year. Oh, this is a unique one, and it's going to be a collector's item. It is. Oh, You're okay. going to have to wait for this. You're going to have to wait. First. I'm glad I brought it up. All right. So 100 degrees outside right now. We topped out at 101, and here at KSAT, we've teamed up with our KSAT community partners to raise awareness for hot cars. And remember, it happens. These heat-related deaths for kids and even pets, people and pets being left in vehicles, it happens every year. A lot of times, or sometimes it's uh, alternative caregivers, but sometimes it's also parents as well. Just something to remind yourself when you're off your normal schedule, do a little 360 around the car, double check the back seat. Look at that, 141 degrees inside that van. That's live, right? That's live. That is our live shot from our, uh, from our back parking lot. 103 on the blacktop and 141 
inside the vehicle. It's just been sitting out there earlier today when the sun was at its highest. It was over 150 degrees inside that that truck that uh, that van. So that just goes to show how hot it gets in those vehicles. All right, let's talk about weather 100 degrees out there right now. It feels like 103 when you factor in the humidity, bright sunshine and a lot of it's that sun that beats down into the car through the windshield. And the windshield acts as a greenhouse and just keeps heating up the interior of the car, just traps that heat in there. So it feels like 103. We're dealing with the heat indices that are above 100. Right now, air temperatures 97 Kerrville and Tarpley, 103 in New Braunfels, Stinson at 99, and Pleasanton, you're 101. For the most part, we're at or even a little above 100, with the exceptions of communities right along the coastline and closer to the coast. Kennedy 96 and Victoria now at 93 where they have the higher humidity, their air temperature gets tempered a bit and it doesn't spike as much in the afternoon. The offset is a pretty potent heat index. So it feels like 104 Victoria, feels like 109 in Gonzales, Del Rio. You factor in the humidity, feels like 107. Just fair weather, very small patchy cumulus clouds streaming overhead. They're gonna be dissipating after sunset, so another clear evening. And I know yesterday I talked about the Perseid meteor shower peaking last night. You can still see them. I mean, it comes every August where the Earth's orbit passes through the debris of the comet Swift Tuttle. And that's why we get the Perseids. And it happens every August. You can still see them. Look off to the northeast, a little lower on the horizon. But it's tough with light pollution around here to see those Perseids. You get a good view from them, of them. If you have a ranch or somewhere you can get away from light pollution, bingo, even better. All right, upper level high. That's still in charge of our weather. That's going to be sliding westward. That's good for us. We like to push this out of our way. The farther we can remove it from Texas, the better. That puts us in this northerly steering flow aloft. That northerly flow picks up little disturbances and impulses of energy and then can trigger a few showers. So starting next week, we've got these isolated chances in the forecast, so about a 20% chance starting on Monday. As for the tropics, one little system, Tropical Depression 11, soon to become Tropical Storm Josephine, maybe gradually strengthening, but probably not all that much as it moves westward and north of Puerto Rico by Monday. Doesn't look like that'll pose any kind of threat or even rain chance, if you will, to uh, Texas. Just some patchy clouds tomorrow, especially in the morning. Southeasterly breeze 5 to 15 and... Back to triple digit heat, 102 for the high. We're going to keep tallying up these triple digit days through the weekend. And then I do think we'll just shave off a couple of degrees next week with that little shift in our weather pattern. It's better than nothing, maybe a little hopeful, but I, I, I do have some confidence in a wind shift and more to uh, trim back our temps a bit. What do you call it? That psychological boost? That's exactly what it is. Degree drop. I just like talking about Christmas because that kind of, <laughs> that's know, also a little psychological boost takes us there. Yeah, we'll be right back. <laughs> Time for our KSAT Q&A where we separate the fear and the facts from what's really happening out there. We are joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg as we are every Wednesday. Mr. Mayor, thank you for joining us. Right off the top, I noticed during the briefing that County Judge Nelson Wolf said that he is signing a new executive order to close the county parks over Labor Day weekend. Are you looking at doing something or have you done something similar for city parks already? Yeah, we, ha we haven't made that announcement yet, but uh, we're going to stay coordinated. Um, you know, I, obviously we want we're concerned frankly, uh, because we still have a very high positivity right now, and we're hoping to get it down because Labor Day is upon us as well as schools opening, and we know if that can go south and in, in, in a hurry. So we want to make sure that we're coordinating and we keep away from large gatherings, and that's going to be one of those elements. So we're going to discuss it, uh, but we'll be staying in alignment with Bear County. What's your biggest concern as we head toward Labor Day? I mean, certainly there were lessons I, I hope that we all learned from the past couple holiday weekends over the summer, but what's weighing on your mind as we're looking at that long holiday? Complacency. You know, it's, that's the big challenge right now. There are, there is no vaccine. There are no proven therapeutics and people are fatigued, frustrated out of work in many cases uh, and want and, and students want to get back to school. We want to see things like sports again. And we're in a situation now where all that hard work, wearing that masks and physical distancing and doing all the right things is starting to move us in the right direction. So letting up too quickly 
can make us go right back into the deadly July that we were having. And I don't want that to happen. Uh, we certainly want schools to be open successfully and safely. And so that's going to require uh, continued vigilance. You know, we did it. We had a town hall last night called Learning During a Pandemic, where we had a couple superintendents, a teacher, a student. Uh, I noticed that the Edgewood and South San ISDs have already said we're not going in person before October. Do you foresee the rest of the school districts doing that same thing? It really depends. Clearly, uh, we are not meeting our indicators yet. Uh, how fast we get to the positivity rate, which needs to be below 5%, or the steady sustained decline, which needs to be 14 days or longer, depends on what happens over the next few weeks. If that happens, then we can begin to start opening schools in person, maybe not all the way, but in, in some degree of occupancy. So I, I expect those school districts that have a little bit more flexibility in terms of planning We'll wait a little longer to make that call. But clearly, those that are erring on the side of, of student and teacher and parent and community safety ought to be lauded for that. Uh, but I think what plays out over the next three weeks, four weeks or so, is going to really determine the pace of school openings. All right, Mayor, stick with us for one more segment, if you will. we got to take a quick sure. break. We'll be right back. We're continuing our KSAC Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg today. Mayor, we've talked a lot here about how the city put together a task force focused on how to safely reopen schools. Uh, that task force made up of medical professionals, <coughs> local teachers, students, uh, school administrators. What is the work right now? What's the status of the work of that task force? You know, they've done a lot of it already, which is to identify the indicators that need to be met before schools can safely reopen and at, at what pace they can begin to open. So first, we have to see a sustained decline of cases, and we're starting to see that. We truly have to see about a 14-day, a two-week period where there is decline in, ca in number of cases over that period of time. Uh, a big one is the number, or, or excuse me, the positivity of cases in the community. Of all the cases that come in, what percentage are positive? What, uh, of all the tests that are done, what percentage are positive? When we were at the peak in July, we were about 25%, which is a very, very high for a community this size. It's now declined to about 12.7%. So a slow decline, but steady. We have to get it below 5% really to, to open up schools and other activities. And then, of course, how fast does it take to double the number of cases in our community? That number needs to go up, and we are above that threshold at this point, which is good, but we'd love to, we want to see that continue to move in that direction. So they talked about that. They talked about um, also uh, what level of opening in terms of occupancy would be safe. And now it's a question of coming together and continuing to monitor those results and, and make any tweaks that are necessary. A lot of budget talk over the last few days, including, you know, estimates like two, three years from now, what it will take to recover from this COVID pandemic. Are you getting a sense, and I want to talk more about this at 10 o'clock about the budget priorities, but are you getting a sense from your fellow uh, members on the city council that they are willing to do the work it takes moving forward? Or do you think some of these things are going to be a tough sell? You know, I, I get the sense that we are. In fact, it started back in March when we when we started the COVID-19 action groups that were really to assess our priorities, our new priorities given this pandemic. We know there's massive unemployment. Uh, we know that, you know, clearly indicated by the food bank lines, the existing poverty in our community was was putting people who were on the edge over the edge, and we now we now need to plan and work towards uh, a sustainable food supply for many people. And uh, frankly, housing security is probably the number one concern for a lot of residents, ensuring there's an emergency uh, emergency relief for people who are being threatened with eviction or foreclosure. You couple that with the loss of businesses and the income and revenue streams for many of our small businesses, our priorities have changed uh, for our community. And so we're addressing those with the change set of priorities in our city budget. And that's going to continue beyond FY21 into FY22 and FY23. But I will say the city council is going to make an important vote tomorrow uh, to put on the ballot a economic and workforce recovery initiative, uh, whereby we are going to get unemployed and underemployed 
residents of our community, up to 40,000 people, back into a training pipeline to get them, get them to stable, stable jobs to help sustain their families. Uh, we simply cannot be, uh, we cannot allow for the massive um, uh, economic catastrophe to continue to, to remain in place as we move through the next few years. And so our focus on getting people back to work and getting folks back into stable careers is critically important right now. And we will watch that vote happening tomorrow. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, thanks as always for joining us. And we'll see you tonight on the Thank night you. beat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll be right back. Well, we know we're not in this alone. Midland's 101, Amarillo 100. Hey, Phoenix 109 and Vegas at 105, but Del Rio right now 104. And we're dealing with the heat everywhere. It's that time of year. We're going to have to get used to it if you're not already because, well, tomorrow we'll start the day at 78, then make it back up to 102 with a lot of sunshine and a bit of a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. Another CPS Energy peak energy demand day. So try to lower your usage between 3 and 7 p.m. One big tip is don't uh, do the laundry between 3 and 7. There you Ooh, go. Yeah. Just gave you an excuse. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Instead, do it at 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that happens a lot in my house. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for watching the news at the 6. See you on the night beat at 10.